All right. Thank you very much, Karen. I am so happy to be here. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who has mentioned in the chat, whether they are new, familiar, or a stranger to process art. Seems like there's a lot of folks that are familiar. So I do want to encourage you at any point that you would like to add on to anything I'm saying, please add it in the chat, uh, because I think the more the merrier. So before we get started, the slide will change. All right, here we go. So before we get going, I want to welcome you. Uh, I am so glad you're all here as an art, as a child. Art was really what got me through. If you look at the image on the left, this is a journal entry of mine from when I was about nine years old. It says, uh, boy, what a drawing, right? And if you're looking at the writing and wondering, hmm, that looks a little off. I do have dyslexia as well as ADHD. So art was really something that did help me. And I really appreciate some of you who may not be as comfortable, but it's sounding like you might be with the arts. I appreciate you attempting to become more inclusive and supporter of early learners accessing the arts. Uh, I'm hoping that this presentation will help you feel confident trying new methods or strategies. So why, how have I gotten to this place of teaching you about some of what I do with process art? Um, I came to Chicago to get my degree in art. Uh, I then interned at the Chicago Children's Museum in 2009, fell in love with it, uh, decided that I wanted to learn more about art education. I went back and got my master's of teaching. Uh, since then, I was a middle school, high school art teacher. Uh, and then I became uh, more full-time at Chicago Children's Museum around 2017. So what is our agenda tonight? We're first gonna be talking about what process art is. I might go a bit quicker through this portion. Why we always encourage using process art. The challenges that might come up. Uh, my favorite materials, some tips on materials management, which I was happy to see in the chat that people are looking for more ideas. There's just going to be a lot of pictures in this presentation and a lot of ideas for displaying uh, process-based art. And one thing too, is if there's ever a question, I'm keeping the chat up at any time, but there will be a time at the end as well. Mm -hmm. So why focus on process? Because there are already tons of opportunity for product-based art, right? So this is not a diss on paint and sips. I myself am a huge fan of uh, painting pottery. So the thing is, it is, it's easy to find, it's easier to access. Um, and then also there's the internet now. So usually on videos on YouTube, you can find opportunities to learn how to do these different uh, projects. So again, a big reason is, again, product is already out there. Um, I myself have used product in the past as well and still think it can be helpful if you have someone that's maybe nervous. It can help to have those steps or build some confidence. So another way you can see the difference of process versus product is on the right. You can see this is a penguin project. This is something you probably have seen in hallways before. Um, and some people will actually tell you that, oh, no, no, this is, this is process based because kids are doing it slightly different. I will say that I don't know if I fully feel that. Um, I would say that process to me would maybe be more like on the left. This is a picture from the art studio where our prompt and our demo was, how can we shape or cut paper without scissors? So if you look closely at this image, I love all the different things you can find. On the right, you can see someone, that pink one that has like these little shapes here, they got really into teeny tiny tearing. And we do work with families. I don't think that that was an early learner that did that, um, but you can see we have probably what is an early learner down here at the bottom where they have decided to make something figurative with legs coming off of this black piece of paper um, and these eyes, and maybe that's a little hat. 
you have someone up here in the corner that is engaging more with composition and design, right? We have this maybe unifying thing happening in the center here. And then look at these different portraits you have happening in the middle here, right? So again, I'm we, we do show them techniques, which is what we say in that comic earlier, but then the people who come are able to use those techniques however they wish. So why process? It creates agency, right? So we are empowering kiddos. That comic that I sh showed while we all were coming in, what I oftentimes see is, is with product base, you're tending to compare yourself with others, right? You're wanting to please the adult or please people around you. Whereas process base is more about the action, the it's you and your work. Right. And so that really empowers children. And one of the handouts, I do have a uh, comic, I believe I included on agency, because uh, I think that's so big for our youngest children. And then, of course, that leads straight into self-esteem. Right. They made this work by themselves. They did the work. They did. the. They had the struggles, even their sense of self. Um, I have found I did teach a class at One River School that was to two to four-year-olds. And when I would get new children coming in, at first they would really struggle with process, right? Because they're so used to being told and directed on what to do. So sense of self would come in because I would how I would get them comfortable was asking them questions like, well, what do you like? What is it that you feel excited to put in this artwork or to draw, right? So that is helping them figure out who they are, um, which is a lot of times, again, some kids are going to maybe already have that strong sense of self, but for kids that maybe need more opportunity, here it is. I also love the process meets children where they are at developmentally. So if, if a kid wants to go further, wants to challenge more, they're totally free to do that, right? Process it makes it really easy for you as the facilitator or teacher to interact with that child and find a way to make that really meet that challenge that they're desiring. And if you have someone that's maybe more into big body that has maybe less confidence when it comes to their fine motor skills, you can absolutely also make that fit their needs. And because I love Paolo Freire, had to put a quote in here, liberating education consists in acts of cognition not transferals of information, right? Process-based art making is absolutely cognitive, right? Making your choices, getting through to the next part. Um, that's what we see, all right? Keep moving. All right. Going a little faster than I wanted to. All right. Another thing is uh, looking at many of your standards as well as Eckers, uh, Crosses Art offers so much opportunity for language development. So this was a very popular project. So those of you looking for ideas, this is one of my favorite things we've done. This was part of a program uh, called Drawing Lab. So it was different experiences of drawing. What you're seeing is we got a donation of these long sticks and then we cut the tips into a nib. So they were able to put these sticks into the ink, which it was actually liquid uh, watercolor concentrate. And we put that in a cup on top of a plate and they were able to make marks that way. So it was a very nice physical challenge collaboratively. It was really great to see day by day how this artwork would transform. So you're thinking about vocabulary, talking to the children about what they're doing, right? It could be asking about, oh, what's, what's happening with this mark right here? How did you do that, right? Or even looking at what's there. How do you think they got this big orange splash, right? Which that was actually just whenever the bucket of paint would tip over, which I thought ended up looking pretty phenomenal. Here we see another big body drawing experience. This was from actually just this past year. Uh, so what 
I also would encourage is if you can get donations of office materials, you could see all of these stickers down here. We got rolls and rolls and we don't use stickers all that often uh, because as a museum, tough to get stickers off of surfaces. But basically there's cardboard boxes that you leave intact, some you pull apart. Um, you also will see children understanding how to negotiate space or where they wanna put more art. Um, this was something too that for, we have a team of teachers that work in the space. It kept things exciting day to day because we'd add more spaces for the kids to add on to, right? Or move things around. Um, so that is another idea. And this photo right here on the right, uh, when I train new teachers in our space, I show this photo and I ask them what they think this child is thinking and feeling. So this program is from a program called Clay Days. It's one of our, um, I guess like our tradition programs because we've been doing it 10 plus years and we're bringing it actually back for the first time since reopening after the pandemic this fall. We show them how to uh, do the slip and score, score and adding slip. We teach them the pinch and roll method and they take those techniques that we show them to make what they like. So you can see here, she's got the body she's created of this creature. And then here's three other legs and look at that gaze of how she's just owning this piece that she's created. So it's pretty great to see some of these children like get to these points of where they're so excited. On the left, this photograph, I love that you could see uh, our educator, Oscar, who may be here today, uh, but he is actually painting along with one of our children that has come into the space. And I think this is also powerful too, thinking about as a facilitator, as a teacher, making sure you try the projects, right? How do you feel about using these materials? Which this was when we were painting our feelings. So we were talking about being expressive and feelings, what they could look like. It's a very open-ended. Uh, and I will tell you more about these materials later. Yeah. Sensory development. So I love on the left here, you can see that there's a strip here. This was from a program that was big and small painting. She's not choosing to paint on this. That's okay, right? She's having this beautiful experience with this blue paint, right? She's obviously keeps going back for it. You can see she's maybe figured out some printmaking on the table surface. We found, uh, especially when we use liquid paint like this, that printmaking kind of will come up uh, in kids' practices. So thinking about as children get older, being exposed to these different textures, surfaces, happens all the time with this practice. Another item that I love using, which I can actually say someone who's in the chat, Marjorie, she's a volunteer that's been with us since 2017 and a retired uh, director of a early learning center. But I was telling her I wanted something for children to run their fingers through. And I had used uh, powdered tempera. If you're familiar with powdered tempera, I, I enjoyed it as a material, uh, but it just was getting really messy wasn't working as well as I was hoping it would, she just suggested adding salt. So salt can be a great textural element to work with. And the best thing for cleaning is it's not going to linger, right? Some falls on the floor, it's eventually <laughs> going to disappear. And you can put powdered tempera into it to give it a lovely color, to make it a little bit more exciting. And you could change it, alter it, and shakers. So if you look here, this kiddo is all about the shaker. Uh, as you can imagine, we would refill these quite often throughout the day, but also you can use salt with liquid watercolor or just watercolor and you get a really exciting reaction, right? So this was a salt painting program with liquid watercolor. So a big part of what process looks like for us is offering choice as well. I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with like choice-based art practices. I think they with the uh, process art go together, but a buffet, right? 
So letting children pick and choose, you might be thinking, oh, but what if they're just gonna take everything? One thing we found has helped is giving the direction of these little cups, these little containers, right? And assuring children they can come back and get more at any time. But that way you're not telling them no, but you're helping yourself as an educator to avoid maybe something that you fear that is gonna get out of hand. Um, another thing I love about buffets, if you have multiple educators using the space, is that they can also alter what's out. I'm completely happy if an educator decides that they don't want a certain material out with it. Like they just can't deal with it that day. That's great. And also that still encourages guests to really challenge themselves to work with just what's there. Oh, and this was from our stuffed art program. Uh, so you can see some examples here in the back. It's uh, one that's pretty heavy in terms of um, we're using staplers to sew. And we do show them how to make a basic pillow shape. But then we show you them a few ideas for how to then make it come alive. Is it becoming a character? Is it a stuffed animal? Um, is it something where they're just doing abstract design on top? So... We know how juicy process art is and how much it can provide our earliest learners, but why aren't we doing it more? And I will tell you, it's because it's hard, right? Um, it can be messy, it tends to be. So if you're someone that has struggled with accepting this, that's part of it, predicting what materials. As a manager, I am constantly having to check how much <laughs> <laughs> I need to get of something because it's it's process and choice. People may all decide they want to use all the pipe cleaners, right? So then we don't have pipe cleaners and that's a material we always want to have on hand, right? There's certain ones. And lastly, you don't have a product to show off. We live in a time of Pinterest, right? We want these experiences to look good, right? That's part of it. So that can be a struggle too. Um, but we have found our way with it, as you'll see. Um, so with mess, mess is a good thing. I loved that when I was uh, training to be a teacher, my person that came in and would check off, you know, is she ready to be a teacher? Uh, I was struggling with cleanup, as many young teachers do. And I was like, you know, it just gets so messy. And I, you know, I'm here so late cleaning up. And she's like, first off, you shouldn't be cleaning. They should. Second off, a mess is a sign that a lot is happening, right? If people aren't feeling brave enough to get stuff going, I don't know. Uh, so for mess routines, knowing many of you are educators, does anybody have a routine or something that you're like, this is my, my technique that just like works perfectly that you wanna share? Or I could share some of the routines I have done I will say that like being more of a museum educator this these days, <laughs> it's easy when adults come with the children, but I will keep an eye out if anyone wants to share their, their favorite techniques. I mean, some of it containers, you notice in the previous slides, having different containers for things, our you know, humanness, we love to sort and match things, right? Here in this image on the right, individual trays. Yes, that is one of my <laughs> items on the materials list, right? Visuals of where things go. Everything is labeled. We do that well. Clear containers. Yes. Ice cube trays. That's a good one for paint too. And especially if you want to keep using liquid paint, if you have a fridge around, uh, you just pop it in the fridge because that's my thing with liquid tempera is that stuff can go bad fast because it's uh, non-toxic. I love that people, these are tried and true. That's why you're seeing things that you've already done. Uh, some other things for me is with getting kids really involved in the routine. I use, when I used to teach my toddler art class, I would use music um, even when it they came to me first thing we always listened to two songs while we drew with markers then they knew by the end to just put markers away 
Then I would set timers throughout art making that different bells would just signal to them like, oh, it's time. And their favorite thing ever at the end was getting to wipe down tables. So, you know, really definitely if you could start creating a routine that's going to go over and over again. And I did make a video for the Children's Museum called Radical Routines, uh, which was to help uh, caregivers that may not be used to having kids at home quite as much. Yes, washing brushes and returning materials to shelves. Yeah. And as all of you know, too, it takes a lot of work in the beginning, but it pays off. Portioned out containers. Yes, we oh, love a good container. Yeah. So with the boundaries, we that we're going right into uh, our our containment is key slide, which is making it obvious where things go. Uh, this image on the right, I do want to make sure you notice that the child is like giving the photographer a sneaky wave. And I absolutely love that. Um, this was during our uh, stuffed art program. And I noticed there was some curiosity about that earlier. So we use staples to staple around three sides and then you stick your hand in, pinch, pull it out, right? then you stuff it. We stuff with newspaper. We have like a water table that we just put slices and slices of uh, newspaper that then you crumble up. So you're even getting into the, do you want it really firm? Do you want it loose? Right? Some kids don't fill up what they create and it becomes a puppet. Ah, uh, I like to, that someone just mentioned also just opening up the discussion of what's happening. Um, you problem solve, you discuss what's happening. I think that's a great thing too, to empower kids to be part of that conversation. Watercolors, pa plastic tablecloths, tablecloths, yeah. Or stuff that you can throw away. Um, I would also say like, I use old shower curtains sometimes. Ah, thank you, Karen. So if you do wanna save this information, it does look like there is a way to do that. So another thing that's helped us, uh, is so with labeling, you can see on all of our containers, we do have pieces of tape that have what it is uh, in Spanish and English. So here we have our basura bowl. We just call it basura, but it's trash. And it's helped a lot where kids aren't having to go so far to throw things away. And we're also able to salvage things because, you know, for kids, it is hard to start differentiating like they may not be ready to really fully understand what is something that somebody else might want to use and what's a scrap so we just go ahead and put it on the table um and then you can see we have the different containers for markers sharpies and paper and let's see i think we finished on this slide finger paint trays so when I was talking about using salt with powdered tempera, we would put that inside of these finger paint trays. And someone was talking about the multi-portioned containers. So you could see we're using these here. Um, one thing too with this is uh, I would put soap inside the liquid paint. So these trays were really easy to wash off at the end of the day. So any sort of dish soap, just put it in your your liquid tempera paint. And that way it's just so much easier to wash. Um, and what they're actually using are clothes pins with cotton balls. So they're getting some very sophisticated fine motor experience because keeping it on the clothes pin or deciding to like try just using the clothes pin itself or just holding the cotton ball. So it also offers different ways of engaging. You could have people standing on either side of a table working together. Um, we, I did put pictures of this in this program, but a popular activity we do is, I call it the pebble push. And you probably have seen it where you take a pebble and, a, and something to make marks with and you push it and your hand just starts moving. And what we found is these trays are perfect for that. Um, it's, it's, that's especially a program I like doing with adults because it is something where the, the pebbles in charge. 
you know, the art is coming out of what the pebble is showing you to do. So those of you that were talking about how you get kind of stuck in the product, maybe it's even bringing in activities that there is no product, right? These are things that are temporary that we would throughout the day wash these off so they could then get covered again. Oh, scraps, old jewelry. Yeah, we have we have some old jewelry too. I get lost with the old jewelry coming up with my own stories. So I know we know that. So now the juicy part, materials. I know as an art teacher, I have very strong feelings on materials, what we've found that works, what we've found that doesn't work. So if you have tried and true materials that I don't bring up, please mention them in the chat. Um, Richeson temper cakes here on the right. I At the Children's Museum, we no longer use watercolor pans. I find they go too fast. The water dissolves that pigment so quickly. The ones that I used to like that you could change out the colors, it was becoming a challenge to find more of that. Richeson Tepper Cakes, there's something about them, not the other brands. I've tried some other brands, Richeson. Um, you can get different sizes of them. We get the jumbo size and we're, the unfortunately for jumbo, you can only just get replacement columns of all the colors. And I, from a safety standpoint, really enjoy them is they dry out. So it's not a matter of they're not going to get moldy. Uh, I do sometimes have to tip them to get excess water out, but they last a long time. And, you know, they do sometimes look a little rough and messy, but I think that's a good lesson too about um, the, the material that we use to make the art it doesn't have to be perfect, right? It's, it's a tool. Watercolor concentrate. So if you do get this Wonder Art Workshop book, a lot of the ideas that they have, you're using uh, vinegar shakers or like dressing shakers with liquid watercolor. If you use liquid watercolor, I'm sure you already know this, water it down. Uh, it's funny, like it comes out of fabrics and materials really easy, but will definitely linger on your skin. Uh, Taclon synthetic brushes. So I, to me, a lot of times people think natural hair, animal hair brushes are better because they're more expensive or they what you've heard about. I find that using them with students, they warp. You don't get those fine points. Um, I suggest if you get some new sets of brushes, that was the first thing I did coming into the my new role. Okay, the I need a little bit of space. Uh, is uh, getting a whole set of flats, which flat brushes have like the flat part at the top and rounds or filberts. I, I guess these are rounds. What I love about having the option of these two type of brushes is one project we've done is how is using a paintbrush different than a pencil? So you're getting children into pulling the brush rather than pressing it down real hard. Um, another thing, Marjorie came up with this that we did is in our early child center in the art studio, we put uh, ribbons. So you can like pull ribbons and that still is echoing this idea of painting. Um, so I would highly suggest getting Taclon or synthetic bristled brushes. They're not gonna warp as easily. Another thing is have some super glue on hand because I feel like no matter the brush, the ferrules, which is the metal part holding the bristles to the handle come off and we just put a little bit of super glue and then you don't lose a brush. And my favorite brand happens to be Royal and Langnickel. Usually you can just look up Royal um, and there's lots of sets. They're not too prohibitively expensive. I like that they are bigger. So for small hands, they're easier to hold. Myself personally, I like some of these brushes better than my own brushes at home. And I think it is because they're meant to hold their shape so well. And I don't know if y'all know about tweezer scissors, but these have been great for kiddos that are not sure which hand is dominant, right? Um, so then you don't have to worry about it. You also don't have to worry about the holes to put your fingers in. So especially your earliest learners, it's a great stepping stone. Um, and people get so excited about them. They're sometimes harder to find. 
it, but you can find them. If you look at like occupational therapist supply companies, they usually have them. And if you want to know our opinion on scissors, Fiskars. I know we have tried getting other brands. They, I don't know, but Fiskars we have done well with. And then also, of course, lefties. Um, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yep. So with, I know oil pastels, there is actually, I have some videos I might share with you where you could see some of the outcomes of two to four year olds using oil pastels and liquid watercolor. Um, there's always a huge impact using the two. We find these cray paws ones that are, are thicker, they're chunkier. These we've really enjoyed using. Um, they do get just as messy as every other oil pastel, as you know. I always feel like oil pastels look so rough, even though they like are so sumptuous. And as we say, they are the paint of the crayon world. Um, so with glue sticks, we use lots of glue sticks for our programs, especially collage. It's just so much easier. Loop scissors. Thank you, Kayla. So loop scissors is also what you can Google to find the tweezer scissors. And one thing I'll tell you, I don't know if anyone's experienced this with ordering a big batch of glue sticks. Uh, and you're like, wow, this is so cheap. And then you get them and they're teeny tiny. I think that's the 0 0.07. Make sure you get the 0 0.22. Uh, it's better to have the big ones. They last longer. Um, but yeah, I wish someone had told me. And here are those trays. I love a uh, lunch tray. Uh, we have metal trays as well. You can see even down here, these um, little smaller trays that fit nicely on tables. Uh, Dollar Tree glue containers. So sometimes you're gonna need some liquid glue for some of your projects, right? Um, I don't like using the squeeze bottles. When I was a middle school, high school art teacher, I would go through refilling all of those, those individual glue bottles. Uh, just for them to just spread it all over their skin the next day. But we have discovered going to Dollar Tree and getting dressing containers with the lids, right? The lids are kind of tough to take up. So you're already helping yourself out with keeping a challenge as well as um, it's easier for them to wait. And then putting them in pencil containers. So again, having a place for things to go especially materials that tend to get a little bit messier. Having these already makes it easier and popsicle sticks. Um, I don't know if I love popsicle sticks and opening a fresh box and that wood smell, so good. And also crayons make bottles for ketchup. That is genius because that's easier to squeeze. I'm sure that also holds more glue so you're not constantly refilling and it adds some challenge with a little heft. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, this bottom picture, renewing crayons, or we we call it, uh, what do we call it? Uh, <laughs> muffin tin crayons. Because usually uh, I use the disposable muffin tins. You break up crayons, pop it in the oven. There's so many recipes online. I don't mind the smell of crayons in my home. So I usually set a higher temp <laughs> so they'll go faster. But if you really are sensitive to smells, put it on a low temp and just keep it in for a while. Uh, and then on the, oh, putting them in the sun. Oh, I'm used to doing a lot of winter programs that like, but that's a great idea. Someone in the chat is talking about putting those crayons in the sun and melting them. So having kids, that would, I would imagine, keep kids busy for a long time, thinking about what's going to happen while it's happening. Uh, drawing with a melted crayon. We did a program with the Design Museum in Chicago about like having a lit candle and putting the crayon into it. And it was about reaching adults' nostalgia with that uh, crayon scent. On the right here, thank you. Oh my gosh, y'all are advanced putting pictures in the chat. Love it. Uh, on the right here, the uh, we have stencils. I was really surprised with toddlers. When we have stencils, they are always about it. 
Um, I think it's that bilateral body movement of holding the stencil, tracing. I even for uh, elementary believe that tracing isn't a terrible thing. Your body is still learning the movement. There's a lot of great things that can happen out of it. And it's empowering too. Um, and a lot of artists, if there's a challenging thing to draw, we'll use something to support them. Do, 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 do. Next one. So a few material steps. If you're just someone that you're like, oh, I can't, I don't wanna do paint in, in my classroom, but it's been a while since we've explored paint. I, we this year have just really come around to quick sticks, the temper sticks. This is the brand so far we like. Uh, I like that they come in so many different colors. We've got neon ones. Um, we have spring break coming up and we've had two really heavy prep and cleaning programs. One was holiday dough where we make the dough by hand. Another one was uh, painting on a wall. That picture you saw earlier of the wall painting was from that. So we wanted something for all of our educators to slow down, but still be like, Bam, impactful. So with quick sticks, Sharpie goes under or over them. All you have to do with Sharpie on top of them is just make sure it's dry, but they dry very quickly. Um, this seems to be the brand that people trust, but if you have a brand that you like better than these quick sticks, let me know. And it's interesting, I'm hearing people say they use them instead of crayons, where I still use crayons separately because I, I, they still like quick sticks doesn't have like the impact with liquid watercolor, but I do think like, yeah, if you, it's either or, I would go probably quick sticks too. Paper. So I, I'm imagining if there's some people that are maybe not artists, but they're bringing art into their spaces. Paper, I think is a big deal and it can make or break some projects. Um, so if you have areas where you want people free drawing, but also not expensive paper, newsprint. Um, that's a thing that is really inexpensive. You can cut into smaller sizes, order the big size. That's a big thing I have done in every place I've taught is paper cutters, right? Get the bigger size and cut it down so it fits your needs. Uh, a nice drawing paper is sulfite and it's very inexpensive. I don't fully understand why. I think it's a bit of recycled material, but there's a tooth to it. Whereas copy paper or cardstock is really smooth. So using sulfite, it actually does take paint fairly well, but it will crinkle. And one thing that I used to do, and that's why I bring this up, is I used to think cardstock was like the best because it's thick, because it's heavy, but sometimes it's maybe not the right choice for paint because the tooth of it absorbs paint in a funny way. So you could look into multimedia paper and trying to get 90 pound or heavier, which I know that's a lot, but if you're thinking about really making these experiences impactful, like for me as an artist, if I don't like a material, it can break my experience. Amazon boxes, I love that. Cardboard is fabulous to paint on. I don't know why I didn't include that in here. Thank you, Anna. That's great. Um, but yeah, we use a lot of cardboard. Oh, tape. Yes. Um, I carry rolls of tape with me everywhere. My nephew asked me why, and then I just start putting pieces on him. He's like, he just turned five. But anyways, love tape. So where, where do we purchase things? Uh, so I always, again, like to share all the things that I like to know as a teacher and uh, someone who has to buy the stuff. NASCO. Uh, NASCO, we love. Uh, you do have to, well, we call them. You could order online, but we end up getting lots of discounts from them now. A lot of times, too, if I'm not quite uh, making the minimum for free shipping, they'll go ahead and give it to me, you know, so it can help to make those calls. If you are wanting to do something that's like a serious take home, or maybe it's gonna be auctioned, if you want some higher quality art materials, Blick, they're usually competitively priced um, when it comes to those types of materials. Dollar Tree, the great outdoors. I love getting to go on a walk during my work day to get materials, right? 
um, which I imagine you could do with your kids too, uh, is have them walk around with you to find things. And uh, sticks and uh, the wire fuzzy things. I, I have a funny thing where I think it's my ADHD, common words I forget, pipe cleaners. Pipe cleaners and some sticks, maybe even some tape too. And the waste shed. So locally in Chicago, there's two locations. Anybody here use waste shed? We were doing a program, the stuffed art, and we needed just big, big rolls of fabric. And they have so much fabric there. And they were really easy to work with where I didn't really have the budget to get as much as I wanted there. And they went ahead and let me have some for free. Um, they do offer discounts. So if you go to the waste shed, make sure to tell them that you are an educator um, because their big thing is they want to sell, uh, celebrate and support educators in Chicago. And if you like sorting, they have sorting parties. I know a lot of us teachers do. I love when I train uh, art teachers and then see, oh my gosh, they love, they love to sort too. So there is a location in Evanston. Uh, and then Kim, do you remember where the other location is? Kim, who's my uh, direct supervisor is in the chat too. Um, so another resource, if you are, I know for myself, oh, I, struggling right now. Uh, and when I'm looking for new ideas or things to do, it helps to go online, see what else, what's out there and specifically museums. I use a lot of museums uh, to get ideas. Um, and we actually, during the pandemic, made a ton of content that you might find helpful, especially if you're having um, people in your communi community or stakeholders that don't understand process art or the reasoning behind. Uh, so I'm not gonna play this fully. I'm just gonna like jump around if this video will load. The internet might be like, Hello. Um, well, can't do it. So I will keep sound off, but they are captioned. Our graphic designer would caption them by hand. So this video goes into the fine motor of using scissors. Uh, Thank you, Kim, for putting these addresses in and Anna. Uh, so this part, I'm talking about how even with kids, you can talk about what do you think we can tear, right? What can we do by hand? So even that sort of exploration with kids tearing, you could do a whole day of that, even with older kids. And in this video, I didn't talk about how when I taught high schoolers, there were some that I had to teach how to use scissors which even in here, I mentioned my favorite way of teaching scissor use. Uh, oh, I know, tearing paper, it's just like, it's satisfying for grownups and children. Uh, so here is I'm um, the thumbs up method, as I like to call it. I've also heard about people putting a sticker or a face on the nail. So when children are doing it, they keep their nail up because a lot of times they want to go like this but you must say, I think I'm literally doing the same right now. Uh, I'm gonna pause this and move on. Uh, so if you go to our YouTube page, you can find that. And there's Kim who's in the ch uh, chat too, who has a lot of resources on tinkering. Um, let's go on. So one thing that might happen or maybe has already happened if you're using process in your classroom is you're going to get an adult coming in who might say, hey, the you know, at blank, the kids made Monet bridges. So my response right away is that's great because I wanna encourage all and any art experiences. I think there is space for all of them, but as an educator, I just don't developmentally want to be doing Monet's bridge. I don't think they're going to quite understand it. It's more, I think, for the, the people who are viewing the artworks. Um, so how do you handle that? I like to say like, I, you know, we could, I could work with that parent to see if there's a place that is doing that so they can find an experience like that. Or if they wanna do it so badly, invite them to come in and do it, right? It's then going to be clear that this is someone in the community doing this. It's not part of your pedagogy. Um, the mission of your space. 
Um, but you're also still um, validating them and that, yeah, like you want to expose art to your child. That's great. And another big thing is handouts. So when I was a middle school, high school teacher, I worked in units. I liked slower art making where we made a lot of practice, um, messy things before we got to the final project. So I made a comic explaining this to um, the caregivers and parents of my students so they would understand. Um, and that's why also I provided, uh, you should have gotten an email or you will get an email with these comics that I've created that would also do some of that lifting for you in terms of why we do the things that we're doing as educators. And like I said, I go online to get ideas a lot. And these are my suggestions on if you were to want to start following some new folks or educators. Uh, yes, thank you, Karen. So Karen said that the handout was emailed. So you should have access to that. And please use it. Um, I made it for everybody. So the Artful Child. This one's really cool. It's, uh, if you're not familiar, it's a group that's been doing process art since the 1970s. And they are constantly posting videos of kids just doing amazing things. And you can tell their space has been in action since the 70s, which is really cool. Curiosity approach. Curiosity, process, very similar. Uh, so what's great about them is they do offer ideas for changes in your spaces. I think they even do um, accreditations, uh, but you know, there's just a lot of resources. Southside Nature Play is a local um, group that is uh, in the South Side of Chicago and it's nature play based. But what I love is Jess, the person who runs it, she puts in so many different places. Like I've learned about places in Chicago I wasn't familiar with. Uh, so definitely I would follow Southside Nature Play because again, you're going to start finding out about things that are happening here in Chicago. Uh, so Reggio Amelia Inspired and Reggio Roots are two very similar ones. Um, again, it's Reggio based, but you're still going to get a lot of ideas for um, process based. And at Reggio Roots too, if you're interested in dual language, um, she does share some of her activities that also include Spanish. And I love that if you, you know, we, we have a lot of Spanish resources at our children's museum. Uh, Louisa Penfold, this is more of a personal account, um, but it's especially if you have someone that's really having a tough time uh, understanding the process art, why is this a big deal? You could say here's an Harvard based art educator. Uh, and she calls her practice contemporary play-based educator. I love that, contemporary play-based. Uh, and then I did want to add one that is going to have a lot of resources for you. The Creativity Project tends to have a lot of um, raffles and they're just, they hit, hit a wide range of things and just are very well curated. Uh, so definitely I can do nothing but support the idea of following different folks to get ideas. Keep yourself excited. Oh, and if anybody has an account that they follow that they think we would like, please share in the chat because I will save it and I will look. Do, 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 do. Ah, so let me look at time and see. All right, so I do think I maybe I'm not going to go too fully into the story because I am going a little bit longer than I intended to. So my big passion is about our hand growth and development. And this started uh, when I was a teacher of teens in my last few years, suddenly they were complaining about hand pain. So I was going to search for answers because I make art daily. It's just part of life for me. Um, and my hands don't hurt. Other parts of me hurt, but my hands don't. And I stumbled on this article, your surgeon's childhood hobbies may affect your health. So they're finding that they're not able to find surgeons that can you do the teeny tiny movements that they need to do in order to do endoscopic type surgeries uh, or surgeries as well. And so they talk about the, the surgeons they do find are people that had hobbies growing up. 
So while their hands were developing, um, woodworking, sewing. Uh, so as early childhood educators, you're really providing a lot of that early experience. And what I have done is put up posters in our art space that the question I put with my display is, how does art help growing hands? And then you just look at these photographs of growing hands. So you're not even like, I think it's, I think it's 10 years old where you have all the bones you're going to have, but it's pretty wild looking up to that point at how many bones appear in just the wrist, you know, the spaces close up. But again, it's like, you can't get this time back while your hands are growing. So I do wonder if there is a correlation with, again, some teenagers complaining about pain, there's less handwriting, um, even with using tablets, I suggest to parents, if they want their kid to use a tablet to draw, don't have them draw with their finger, get them a stylus, right? We want to engage that wrist in their hands. So display. So I actually think there's lots of exciting ways of displaying process art. Um, one thing you'll notice throughout is that there is this grouping element to it. I always, as an art educator, have been into the idea of I'm displaying everyone's work. I don't like to pick and choose. Again, that's where we're getting more competitive, uh, which again, there is room for competition in art making, but it's just for me and my practice and where I work at the museum, that's not what we're about. Uh, you can engage adult viewers with questions with your display. So rather than a description, give a question. So they have to sit and really look and think about what they're seeing. Photos of children making the work. Uh, this is one thing I'm able to do is we have staff that happen to like photography and I just have them come when we change programs and have them come around, take pictures, right? So having those photos at my disposal is great to share. And then when you're thinking about how do you find the inspiration for the activities, I, I you know, use themes a lot. Uh, so when we were painting feelings, I did space art when I worked uh, with my own class of children and we watched videos of spaceships taking off, watched someone brush their teeth in space, which was like, whoa, uh, and gave them silver materials, um, foil. And what came out of it was really exciting because you still got that vibe of outer space right? But you're not pressuring kids to maybe draw figuratively quite yet, because that may not happen until four or five, right? You're looking into drawing development. Um, and that could be exciting too, because then when you're displaying, bringing those elements into the display. Now you're going to see pictures. So you can hang their work. This here is our chandelier. And this, I know you're probably thinking, Liz, how are we going to manage this? We did have engineers work on this with us, but what we did is we had these areas you could hang on the table and we had, it was all color themed and post-it notes, tin foil, beads, sequins. So the beads and sequins going on to the pipe cleaners. So this way it just kept growing and being put together. Um, if I have a moment in a bit, I might show you some footage of when this was created, but you could do this on a smaller scale, right? Um, if you have a, a rack of some kind, right? A coat rack or just even individually using, why am I blanking? A hanger, right? Uh, which I did do a comic about art with hangers because it's one of my personal favorite materials and I've always found with engaging school communities you can always get hangers um so there's one option uh the one that we use most of all is letting kids hang their own work right so having some string up as well as clothespins the clothespins themselves kids get really into just using right the squeeze the open um, they're also considering where their artwork is going in relation to others. Uh, so I don't know, I would suggest thinking about it one way you can make sure there's always art up is having kids access to hanging their own work. 
Mm -hmm. Ah, someone was saying too that they've used long sticks to hang artwork from. Uh, growing a display. So this one is actually, this is like a burlap, which is our soil. Guests were, this was right when we reopened after pandemic. Everything was feeling kind of quiet and not great. Um, so we just decided to lean into it. And we're like, let's grow together. So like, you can imagine that these three beds, as we called them, um, were very bare at the beginning. But as our regulars came week by week, they got to see it grow. So the first thing we did was do flowers. And we talked about radial symmetry, which I don't know if you've tried this with your littles, but I was really surprised to see toddlers really respond well to the idea of like um, helping fold the paper. So then you have like a line guide and the idea of just using that grid to create a flower out of. So they really understood symmetry um, in a powerful, intuitive way. And again, since we are choice-based, you'll notice on the left here, a lot of these flowers aren't using the symmetry and that's fine, right? Make what you wanna make for our piece together. As an educator though, I will say this was a lot of work because I would once a week glue everything together. Um, and then just wanna mention, I will tell you, if you ask kids to design leaves, I didn't think that was gonna be the exciting part of this project, but boy, oh boy, boy was I wrong. They loved creating different leave personalities. Um, so even simple prompts like that, like designing leaves. Uh, and then we did bugs. And then the last thing was just, what do you think our garden needs? And then displaying it, I took the materials that we use to put it, which is the extra burlap down here at the bottom to give the idea of soil and then the title of it. Uh, I don't know if anyone's used plastic wrap in this way, but this was inspired by uh, Hebrew Brantley took over our studio space. I don't know if you're familiar with Hebrew Brantley, but his work is phenomenal. Um, he does a lot of street art, mural work. Uh, and so we were inspired, inspired by that because a lot of street artists will use plastic wrap around trees to have a painting surface, right? And if you can get, if you're thinking, if you want to do something large scale like this, right? You can go and get like shipping plastic wrap to do this. And it's not as expensive as you would think. Um, and then the mixture to put this up was inspired by wheat pasting. We didn't call it wheat pasting because I mean, we're seeing people once maybe. So to spend our time figuring out the language, it's just uh, Elmer's glue mixed with water and then these big brushes. So you would brush the glue up there put your paper and it was just copy paper and then glue on top. And we use Sharpies and you could see even the tables got really interesting. So again, you could make your own temporary walls. This is like messing up my flow, how getting to each slide takes a little bit longer on Zoom. Next time I'll remember that. Come on now. Come on PowerPoint, you can do it. Okay, so there, uh, <laughs> oh yeah, and Jess from Southside Nature Play is here. So if you wanna contact her too, uh, she's in the chat. So our display here. So we displayed one of those plastic walls uh, and then we put artwork for our theme of things that fly. So, Flying was also something that was very surprisingly uh, a, a theme we've used multiple times because kids were so engaged by that action of imagining yourself flying. Uh, so one thing you'll see in here is when I was a middle school, high school teacher, I mounted kids work before I displayed it. I have, I don't know if any of you have horror stories of what happens when you uh, put a kid's work up and then you can't get it off, right? So I would say if it's work that's going home to children, make sure you're mounting it before putting it on the wall. So then you could be a bit rougher on the wall to make sure it sticks. Uh, invest in corkboard strips. So that was something too I did when I was at a school is, you know, put you know corkboard strips above the lockers where we're usually hanging work. And gaffer's tape. 
Gaffer's tape is like a theater based tape. So it's gentle on surfaces, but it's really strong. Um, and I've always found it helps me feel very confident that the work is going to stay up. So some design tips. Um, so you can use color to help theme it, you know, and I think that's probably something that you probably already know about. But another thing is Googling the principles of design. Working with the Design Museum, what I loved about them is we had a discussion about how we're all born with intuitive design knowledge. The way that we've come up what's visually pleasing is from what people think is visually pleasing. So oftentimes you can kind of let go and feel design-wise what's going to work. And you see it in your children. You know, people I think laugh when I take so seriously children who are two or three's compositions, they know how to use the space right? They move around the space in really interesting ways. A lot of times they'll also know when to stop. Uh, so one thing I always suggest to adults that don't feel very confident in coming up with new or different kind of installations is listen to your gut, right? But also we have the internet at our, <laughs> at our fingertips. So you can look at different ideas, right? If you're going to use contrast as a theme for your installation, right? Um, you know, having two very different things or things that are almost like in conflict with each other, that can be visually interesting. Repetition, which is what we usually use, um, using variety, balance is an interesting one. Um, and that even goes into odd numbers look better. That's just something that's usually, we have these rule of threes, um, but there is something where five just like, it just feels right. I don't know, three is right in the middle there. And then you got one, I don't know. Um, and then who's your audience? One thing too, is thinking about making sure that it's in viewing height. Uh, that's something we think about at the museum where you'll see a lot of displays go very low on the ground because we do want our littlest learners to be able to see it. Um, uh, and I mentioned this before, but having pictures of the work being created. I think we might be reaching the end. That's right. So I did want to leave some time for a Q&A, but before that, I am wondering if I could show some action videos I have of toddlers doing some. I'm going to share again, but I'm going to share something different. So for me, I use my Instagram as a almost a way that I can share my portfolio or, um, you know, I just always like that people can see the work. And as an art educator, my work is very visual, but it's mostly in my stories because I don't like the idea of, you know, I don't know, it's just my habit. So I have this folder here. Um, so first is these older kids. And uh, during the winter, I love taking liquid watercolor outside with snow. To go to the bathroom, so they pee all over the rainbow pee all over the place. Okay, you're good. <laughs> um, so with that one, that was uh, that was again when you're thinking about the interesting things that people will come up with uh, when it comes to uh, what they're coming up with. So this video now is a toddler. She had been in my class uh, for I think probably many weeks at this point. Um, if you can't hear what she's saying, I will I will try and repeat. But what they're using, we were talking about, I believe, C-related imagery. And with this class, I always had the children working very big. Um, and because where I worked, we had the, the money to get watercolor paper that big. So we went for it. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh. Yeah. These are allergies. There's allergies. It's almost allergies. Oh, allergies? So, uh, these things are the ducks are allergies. They're allergies? What do they do in the ocean? They, they make, they make, they make the, the animals that live in the sea. Yeah. So you can see where she even came up with a story about the allergies. So these beautiful conversations come out. Um, this is again, liquid watercolor in these tiny jars. Um, 
And this was also, I think this child was someone too that struggled with uh, which hand was dominant. Um, this is Children's Museum. I'm wondering if I could see the chandelier. Uh, we did a fingerprint art experience. This is the toddlers. Ooh, there's sharks in your water. And me, the artist shops, they're blue, and you got fishes so I just wanted to share some of those conversations. Um, the big brushes, big canvas.